Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Collegiate Star League. We are going to be hopping into a really awesome match today. It is going to be RIT versus University of Waterloo. So hopefully you guys are ready and action-packed waiting for this next series. Here we go. We're going to be hopping into game number one. I think we've already loaded into the game. My name is Fear Dragon, by the way, and I'm joined by the one and only Joe from Nerd Street Gamers. How are you doing today, Joe? I'm doing excellent. My mic is working now, and that's always a better situation to be in than uh, kind of the opposite option, which is not working mic. And uh, <laughs> I think we're in for a pretty great first series. Mm hmm yeah, as we start up here in the top right-hand corner of the map, on top of the red Terran player representing University of Waterloo, give it up for Buster, also known as Sidious, it seems like, who is uh, the coordinator for University of Waterloo. And uh, spawning in the lower right-hand corner, we have our blue Terran, probably the favorite in this matchup, playing for both uh, RIT and Team Ascension Pro. It is Pope Bunny. Oh, wait, he left Team Ascension Pro. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you want to call it anything, you can call it Team Descension. <laughs> <Love that. laughs> oh, man. Well, I just had the uh, the privilege to sit in a in a call while uh, Poke Bunny was casting a match, and he was telling me a little bit about uh, post 3.8 TVT. So I kind of want to I want kind of want to talk about that and shed some knowledge. Because if, if he's saying it, it's probably going to kind of look like what he's doing. Drop so, the knowledge box. He was talking about, uh, there's basically two things that happen in the current TVT meta. Uh, Terrans either go mech and the games are really long and positional play, or they just drop each other to death and they keep dropping and no one really does damage and then someone misses one beat and then that person dies. So I think those are kind of the two. player Poke Bunny is? I think he's more of the latter. I, I believe he is more of the player that does not want to go to the Super Lake game. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you. Um... I know he likes to he likes to find builds he can optimize and then just keep optimizing them until he's squeezed every last drop of uh, blood out of that stone. And that's I think that's a little easier to do when you're like focusing on just executing an attack right versus playing a long drawn out game where there's back and forth and there's uh, different game decisions pause. and that kind of thing. Uh, Buster's going to make the decision to go for a pause here, perhaps attack pause. Yeah. Possibly attack the plaza. It seems like he's resolved whatever problems were he was facing, but we do have a pretty quick factory coming up uh, for Buster, uh, but it is a little bit slower than Poke Bunny's. I do wonder where things are going. Oh, Poke Bunny canceling something on his factory and offs to build a Hellion instead of a reactor, I think it was. Uh, maybe a bit of misplay over here from Poke Bunny, saying, like re not remembering that he was actually building a reactor on top of his barracks or maybe it was a tech lab i actually didn't get to catch it yeah i didn't quite manage to see what it was either but uh i don't think there's anything you would have seen right like at the front a single reaper nothing that's going to trigger you to change your build that drastically losing all that production time yeah i think it may have just been a like a decision change and saying oh you know maybe i'll go for like the tanks and then he says actually you know what i think maybe i can get some damage done over here and he is getting some okay damage done the reaper already up to two kills killed a couple of marines and is still continuing to poke on forward this hellion also provides a little bit of safety because if any of those marines get too close to the low ground the hellion can fire from there yeah he's gonna continue to kind of hang out around here containing his opponent for a little bit and uh Buster doesn't have any or doesn't have any Reaper Hellion of his own, rather, uh, which puts him in a bit of an uncomfortable position until those Cyclones come out, and then he kind of has the mobility he needs, but it's really hard for Cyclones to kind of get in there and DPS against uh, Reaper Hellion, which is just a bit more mobile and kiteable of a composition. Yeah, and even though it's not exactly about the mobility, I'm actually a bit surprised to see the Cyclone coming out this early versus the Siege Tank. The Siege Tank, I think, provides not quite as much mobility, but it definitely shuts down any form of harassment, shuts down any form of Hellion harassment without a medevac. It just makes it so difficult to actually do a whole lot, but oh, the Cyclone, if it can get some damage done, it's not the Cyclone of old, so it cannot lock onto ground targets, but it will be useful versus this medevac that he's going to be facing up against. Ooh, Ravi, but this drop is coming into the back of the natural, and it's completely undefended. We're going to see four Marines and a Siege Tank on load down here, and uh, with these Hellions to help buffer against any bio or SCV pulls that comes down, uh, this is just going to be so, so hard for uh, Buster to engage cost-effectively. His own tank is going to siege up just north of the natural base here, and that's going to allow him to at least kind of prevent Poke Bunny from moving further in and gaining a further beachhead in this situation. But this is a, a really nice drop that's even just denied an enormous amount of mining time already. 
Yeah, and here we go. It looks like Buster really wants to clean this up. He is going to try and focus fire down the tank. He gets Poke Bunny's tank while keeping his own alive. So nice micro. Viking also going to chase down that medevac, but I don't think he's going to be able to... Oh, he does get it with the Marine still inside. Really well done by Buster. Yeah, that was an excellent defense. I think a lot of people probably took a look at this and said, hey, we've got a pro player against a guy that's like, you know, high masters, respectable level of play. But uh, generally speaking, you see the pro win out. But so far, Buster... Uh, doing very well to deal with, I think, a pressure that a lot of lesser players would have kind of crumbled under and not known how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And while I still do not want to take away from Poke Bunny, he is a very, very solid uh, pro player. It is something worth noting that Poke Bunny is known for his early aggression. He's known for his early micro. And let's be very, very blunt about it. He's known for his all-ins. So as we go into the later stages of the game, I wouldn't necessarily give poke bunny the same advantage that i would give versus a lot of other players now this viking advantage for poke bunny is very very nice i think in poke bunny still has a lot of options available to him especially with a third being taken but i think if buster can bring this out into a late game tvt this could work in his favor yeah absolutely uh, buster now attacking his natural <laughs> command center that's not yeah, that's really going to work in his favor well you know and now poke bunny might think he's more ahead than he really is <laughs> Anyway, these Vikings are going to be kind of poking around, sharking around, maybe looking uh, to see if they can catch a medevac or something out of position. Buster's going to try a cyclone run by down here at the third base of Poke Bunny, but he's got forces in position to defend this. And I think we're just going to see this kind of stabilize and uh, move into a, a macro game where Poke has a bit of an economic lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely will work out that way. Now, economic leads in TVT are a little bit different than economic leads in almost any other matchup. I mean, in PvP or ZvZ, you say, oh, your opponent is three workers ahead of you. That's actually a massive difference because it's a mirror matchup. But in TVT, mules just sort of change the way that things go. It makes it so that a small worker lead, not nearly as big of a deal as it is in many other matchups, not to mention just the fact that siege tanks and many other units in TVT just do so much damage that it kind of just makes it so that positioning can be sometimes more important than having more units. Yeah, and I think we're going to see a little bit of uh, awkward positioning out of both players soon because Buster is moving Ooh. out onto the map here and Poke Bunny is loading up pretty oh. much all of his units into a Doom Drop. <laughs> An immediate retreat from Poke Bunny with his Doom Drop. He spout, scouts out the entire army moving across the map and he says, no, you know what, I think I actually want to be over here to defend my third. And again, with the information gathering that Poke Bunny is using, he may be able to take a really advantageous engagement. Yeah, setting up on the choke a point of this bridge is really nice. He can set up a concave with the bio, which means he can't really push through. Oh. These Vikings chipping away. I think they grabbed a Viking for free, was that? Yeah, now it's three Vikings to one, and that's going to force Buster back. That Viking advantage is a really big deal because if you have the air superiority, you can push back your opponent's medevacs, and you don't necessarily have to use scans in order to get vision for your own tanks. Buster now is going to take a position at the watchtower here, and uh, these two armies look like they're about to clash. Buster starts to retreat. The Vikings oh. and Poke Bunny step forward and start focusing things down. Poke Bunny thinks this is a fight he can take, and it looks like he could be right as his units start to push on through here. Yeah, I think he is definitely in the advantage in this situation. Even the Viking is going to land. He loses two Vikings, a bit of a questionable decision to land the Vikings there, but I mean, you just take a look at the Siege Tank count right now, and even though, yes, Buster has a Marine count advantage right now, the Marines are much more replaceable. 21 to 8, sure, that's in Buster's favor, but the Siege Tanks are so difficult to replace. 3 to 7, Poke Bunny has a massive lead in that count. Once again, we're going to see two trains passing in the night here as Buster loads up a drop. Poke Bunny's got his own Doom Drop headed in here. And I don't know what Buster has in position to defend this. This could do a huge amount of economic damage. Ooh. All of these tanks get out unscathed. The uh, SCVs come in here for the hug of death, but the siege up is good. And uh, GG is called. Mm -hmm. Poke Bunny takes game number one for RIT. Well done by Poke Bunny. And a quick note, Poke, uh, Buster did go into Poke Bunny's natural expansion during all of that. Poke Bunny was just prepared with three missile turrets. Immediately, Buster had to turn around, and it was just a difference in preparation there. Who had units? Who had defenses prepared for that big drop?
And I think even more than that to me, because I used to be a CSL player back in my day. I had a terrible win record, but actually, no, I had a 100% win record because my team never trusted to uh, actually field me very often. <laughs> but I did win my only uh, couple of games. But the coolest thing about the CSL is just the community that it ends up building. You get to meet and find a bunch of people who are passionate about StarCraft or enjoy StarCraft the same way that you do. And it's such a great organization for just promoting that kind of growth. To just promote having fun with StarCraft and playing on a team together, being able to talk about StarCraft with other players, I think that's the best part of CSL to me. And of course, one really good way as I transition out into a, a bit of a sponsor plug-in here is that if you want to communicate with people that you meet for your CSL team or for just people you know for who play StarCraft in general, check out Band Gaming. They have a really, really great product where you can actually use it to communicate with all your friends that play StarCraft. You can use it to schedule events. It's just a great media platform for that. Yeah, and on that note, we're actually going to play a little... Uh... A little ad from them so you guys can learn a bit more you know sometimes it comes better from the mouths of the guys that make the product than us so we're gonna play a quick ad you can learn a little bit more and when we come back we're gonna have a uh, I love coloring versus the Riddler only $14.99 Don't miss the call. Download Band. Communication made easy. Gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the CSL. We've got another great matchup coming up here. Uh, it's going to be uh, I Love Coloring playing for RIT versus, I guess we have to call them Livy B, right? <laughs> uh, but it's not the Livy B from Waterloo. Yeah. Are you sure about that? I think Livy B from Australia may have gone to Waterloo University or University of Waterloo and uh, decided to play for Canada. It's possible. That makes a lot. You're making a lot of sense here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm definitely picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> but I, I think to be perfectly clear, guys, this is a Terran player. So this is uh, most likely not Livy B, unless this Livy B has been. I don't. I don't even know what I'm saying. This is going to be an interesting cast. 
<laughs> Either way, it's worth noting that the player formerly known as Livy B, or currently known as Livy B, however you want to put it, is a Grandmaster level Terran player, so should expect some pretty decent level play out of that player. Yeah, and I know that uh, I Love Coloring, at least when he came down to Cheese Adelphia 3.5, was uh, right at that edge between Grandmaster and uh, Masters 1. He took a game off X Kawaiian in the group stages, I think. So we're, we're not going to see low-level play out of either of those players, and that's pretty exciting for me. And I think we should go ahead and introduce our first player spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, playing for Team RIT. It is I Love Coloring. <laughs> And spawning up here in the top left-hand corner of the map, we have the Red Terran player representing Team uh, University of Waterloo. Give it up for Livy B. Quote unquote. So this is these are probably the memeiest two names you're ever gonna see in a game, right? Just like taking someone else's name and then I love. I don't know, them. man. Major used to be known as Anna Prosser. Who did? Major. Oh, well, to, Ben, yeah. you can't count wow. major names. Up Officially changed his name to Anna Prosser. You can't count major names. That's like, oh, I don't even want to like jump into some of the names majors had over. Because if we start that, that's just going to be the whole cast, right? Like Princess, yeah. Windy, Light. Uh, I think he had a Livy B account at one point. Wouldn't doubt it. Wouldn't doubt it. But uh, TVZ, a bit of a different matchup, and man, have we been seeing some interestingly different changes in the uh, 3.8 patch for TVZ. Honestly, it's I can't even find consistency in which players or which uh, race seems to be doing better, because both sides seem to be complaining equally as much. Well, well, I listen to a lot more Terrans than Zerg, maybe, but I... <laughs> I hear more Terran complaints than Zerg. I think uh, Zerg players, I, I don't even necessarily think it's that Zerg is stronger. I think uh, the changes to Zerg were less fundamental, so it was easier for Zerg to just kind of figure out. You know, I think a lot of Terran units may end up being stronger in the long run once people get used to kind of non, uh, non pick upable tanks again, once people get used to how the new Cyclone works. Uh, a lot of the Zerg changes other than the Ultra List is just strength, but we do have this first Reaper coming in. Yeah, and interesting to know it's just one Reaper, and this is one of the things I was going to talk about. Oh, trying to pull the drones for a civil surround, not quite able to get it, but, you know, having the gold minerals being mined, and of course, keeping all of your workers alive is definitely going to be nice. But I was going to say, one of the things I've heard a lot of Zerg players really still complaining about is just the fact that 3 Rex Reaper is still incredibly strong right now. There haven't been really a lot of changes to Reapers, so Reaper plays have just been strong since before 3.8. And a lot of Zerg players were struggling it before, and now they're still continuing to struggle with it. But we're not seeing any kind of crazy Reaper aggression coming out of Libby B. No, and it's almost too bad because when you take that gold first, like I Love Coloring is doing, uh, it means that you're very exposed in a lot of ways. And 3x Reaper aggression can be very powerful because the Reapers can obviously bounce between the bases. They can uh, go up over that ledge, and they can just kind of be very slippery and hard to catch, like doing what Reapers do to the max. You have no creeps to protect you. But uh, that hasn't gone punished, and instead I Love Coloring is going to be setting up a big attack here. Yeah, lots of Zerglings being flooded, seven Banelings being morphed in right now, and this is definitely going to be a really big Baneling bust, but I don't even know if a bust is the correct word for this, because there's not even much of a wall to really bust down. There's no wall at the natural expansion, it's way too early for that, and maybe there's a wall at the main base that he can try and bust down, but I don't even know if he's going to need to, because the supply depots are down and the Zerglings are going to make their way in. Yeah, and these Banelings, ooh, are actually going to crash into that Supply Depot. That was a bit unfortunate, ooh. and I think that's really going to enable uh, Livy B to have an easier hold here. These four Hellanes are doing a great job of cleaning up all these Lings. They uh, just can't quite get the surface area they really want. Any engagement is not going to be favorable for I Love Coloring. He's trying to put some hurt onto the wall, but uh, I think the army may now be big enough for, I, uh, for Livy B to start stabilizing a bit. Yeah, able to take out some of these supply depots as well as the add-on onto the factory. So that is a nice start, but only four workers so far. This was a really big investment for color, and I don't really know if it was worth it so far. Yeah, I don't think this has paid for itself at all. As a player that on this map likes to baneling bust a lot, uh, you really want to kill like 12 SCVs minimum and then contain them into their main. And I love coloring has not accomplished either of those goals. 
Uh, instead, he's just kind of hung out. He's denied uh, mining at the natural, but that's not that important in the long run because the base is still there, and uh, livabee has been able to hold that low ground, and what that means is uh, I Love Coloring can't contain him. He can't be super greedy. He just has to kind of sit out here and be content with map control, and even that looks like it may be forfeit as the Hellion count continues to rise. Yeah, and I'm loving the play out of Livy B right now, going for the new Raven upgrade, which for those of you that don't know, it increases the damage by those Hunter Seeker missiles by a decent bit, 30%, and increases the tracking range. And what that means is it's almost a guarantee, it's almost a 100% guarantee that your Seeker missiles will hit something. They won't just like fizzle out about 90% of the time. And uh, that's a really, really difficult thing to deal with. Even a Banshee being made is going to make it a lot easier to deal with this big Roach aggression that's coming out. Yeah, and I love coloring. It's going to continue to try to put some hurt onto this wall here. Uh, a single Banshee is going to come out, and I think that's going to spell an end for most of this aggression, unfortunately, for a Zerg player. Yeah, actually, we can see the Spidey Bow wall comes down, and Livy B is now very comfortable using these Hellions to kind of deal with the remnants of this attack. Oh. And uh, it's cleaned up. Ooh, I was about to say nearly flawlessly, but we do see a couple great connections on top of that SCV line. Yeah, uh, with the Roaches are going to go out and have to trade out for some of these SCVs. Not exactly the best trade still. Uh, 10 workers or 11-ish workers killed is definitely not too bad for color, but it's just, I'm not sure if it's enough. I feel like he's already so far behind. Third command center is finishing up right before his eyes, and there's not a whole lot he can do about it. He does not have an economy behind this. Yeah, indeed. Only 25 drones to 35 SCVs. We're going to see a decisive lead in uh, in economy going to the Terran player. Of course, Color can choose to dedicate uh, like all of his production to drones right now. And I, I think it's a really risky move, but it might be the right one. He knows there's Hellions out on the map, but he has a decent link count with some roaches to kind of anchor that. And perhaps he can just bank on having his units in the right place and holding it. But uh, if we see Color just try to play it safe here, I think he's just going to fall further and further behind, and that is a quick shot to death. I mean, the reality is the biggest thing that I think Color is lacking right now is tech. He does not have a lair. He doesn't have that many queens out. He's starting to get up to number five, which is pretty good, but the Banshees are going to cause all sorts of problems. Cloak is on the way, although it didn't actually get researched first. A uh, bit of an interesting decision, I guess, from Livy B, who went for the Raven upgrade before really making any Ravens, and then got Banshees up. But either way, these Banshees are going to be able to put on a decent amount of pressure, I think, uh, especially with the Hellions backing them up. Yeah, these Banshees are going to be stepping up now. Uh, you did mention that interesting decision, and I almost wonder if the, the first Banshee was a bit of a panic Banshee, you know? Like, hey, I want to go into Ravens eventually, but I'm going to make this one Banshee so I can... Oh, hold that thought. These Hellions are getting all up Ooh. into this drone line. Nine have gone down already, and it looks like uh, more are going to continue to fall. This queen is trying its best to defend, but that's not enough. There's four queens down at the natural, and they'll be enough to eventually drive this off, but oh, man. It's okay. The queens killed their own overlords. The Hellions were really afraid of the fact that, oh my god, these guys are crazy. They're willing to <laughs> kill their own overlords. we got to get the hell out of here, so... Hellions do back up, but the damage has already been done. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Carbot, if you're listening, that's a great idea for a sketch. But anyways, some of these uh, lings are going to try for a run by. But Livy B just has too much... Uh, it looks like Hellion Banshee is going to be the play here with some Liberator support. This is kind of a composition you see pretty often in the early game. But I don't think you generally see it going up to this quantity... Uh, perhaps Levy B just feels they're far too ahead for it to even matter, and they just want a mobile composition that they can kind of troll around with and have some fun uh, picking off the last of Color's economy. Yeah, I think just making sure Color can't really expand or play greedy is a really good way to play this out. Make a mobile composition that's good at just keeping your opponent back, making sure they can't get hyper-aggressive and try and all in again. And also make sure that they just can't ever over-drone right now. I think that's a really, really smart way to play this. And honestly, this is just a great tale of Livy B maintaining a lead. Yeah, this is getting uh, really difficult for color. I think the fat lady is getting ready for her final encore here as uh, these Hellions deny mining at the main and the natural and the third, which is all of the bases, unfortunately, for color. Uh, drones are just falling everywhere. Detection is now down at the third. And I think this may be all she wrote as a... Uh, I, I just don't know what moves Color has left in his back pocket. 
I mean, we got upgrades finishing up, but those upgrades are not gonna save him. He's down almost half the supply right now of Livy B, and even though Livy B is actually starting to lose some units on the uh, offense, I guess some of these Banshees actually are not detected, so never mind. I take it back. And I want to note again, Layer Tech is finished up. We have a Hydralis Den finished up. We do have the Groove Spines finished up. And yes, some Banshees are going to die. Things are looking up for color. But it's a question of how much are they looking up right now. It is a comparison point, and it's not looking that great. You know, there are a lot of Terrans that right now would look at this game and probably say, hey, he's got like four Hydras and the Spine upgrade, man. Yeah, the Zerg's got this. But I, but I think... I they, they don't work quite as the old Ultralists do. It's not just like, I have two Ultralists with Kiteness plating, therefore I win the game. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe Hydras just need a Kiteness plating. I really like Livy B because we're seeing all of the upgrades that I have to mouse over to know what they are. Oh man, Hyperflight Rotors is a pretty freaking awesome upgrade, man. This Liberator is also going to be very difficult to deal with with the positioning it's at. Fourth expansion trying to be taken by color, but it's... I mean, can he even afford to defend his own three bases, let alone a four? Yeah, I think that's kind of just the hail mary, you know. You're you're down, you're down in the fourth, and uh, you've you've got to find some way to come back. So you throw a drone over to your own fourth, uh, take that and say, hey, maybe he won't notice. And uh, you know, Livy B didn't really put any pressure on it, so so far so good. Plan working out. Yeah. As I say well, that, of course, <laughs> three cloaked banshees show up and uh, start raining that hellfire down. Uh, the hatch reaction complete, so no cancel available. And this is a pretty difficult spot here for color. I mean, let's call it what it is, Joe. We have five starports right now for Livy B. He is taking a fifth expansion and shutting down the Zerg player's fourth expansion while also killing off workers at the third. I do feel like the only thing this game is really lacking is Livy B hasn't thrown down a fusion core. No, sorry, there is a fusion core down. Livy B just hasn't started the battle cruisers yet. Yeah, I would love to see battle cruisers. This is so. Is this I would a love to see Livy B just push in with the army that Livy B has to end the game? Honestly, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. As a Zerg player, this is a situation you sometimes find yourself in. Where, like, because you're held on your side of the map, you don't really know how far behind you are. You're on four bases, and you're like, well, I'm on four bases, I have 50 drones. This would, like, in a normal game, this would be okay, but this isn't a normal game. And uh, I think Color is going to pretty soon find out what's wrong. The, 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 real, the real horrifying moment in these kinds of games, if your opponent is trolling you a little bit, which I think Levy B might be, uh, you see... You see all the SCVs walk across the map, and you're like, oh, all that supply is about to become battle cruisers." So I'm going to actually go super meta on this right now, Joe, because, yeah, there's there's a Hellion run by. Drones are going to get roasted, but let's be real. It's, there's no more damage that's already been done. I'm actually legitimately wondering whether or not uh, University of Waterloo has both their 2v2 players here. Because this, <laughs> I used to implore in my collegiate star league days where oh some of your players aren't here just yet draw off the game as long as possible kill your opponent slowly to buy time for your teammates to get here for one of your other teammates to phone up your you know your 2v2 players and say hey what the hell are you doing and it's like oh we're at chipotle you want to come out hang out at chipotle it's like no get over here we need to play a csl game i'm legitimately wondering if that is the case right now because that is the exact style that Livy B is playing right now. <laughs> you know, I think you might be right, and I think they may have just gotten back with some burritos uh, because we do finally see the push-out from Livy B. Uh, an entire fleet of Liberators is going to be sieging up over this. And there's the <laughs> GG. Sees the Liberators and taps on out, and it does seem like we have a tied-up series now, one-to-one. -one. University of Waterloo showing some strong games. Yeah, absolutely. So tied up series, that means we're going to have the uh, the Archon and the 2v2 for sure. And then if it does go to that 2-2, two -two, that tie series, then we of course see the 1v1 ace match. Uh, for guys that don't, uh, any of you guys that don't know, this is a pro league style match where the first four matches, uh, everyone knows who they're going to be playing in advance. The players and teams were blind picked. Once we get to the ace match, both teams can send out whoever they want. 
as long as they've only played one match previously. So uh, you can either play in the 1v1 and the 2v2, uh, the 1v1 and the Archon, the 2v2 and the Archon, or you can play in one of those matches and, of course, the Ace match. Indeed. And I honestly have got to say, just based on these two games so far, I feel like the most likely candidates for an Ace match will end up being Poke Bunny versus Libby B. I do feel like that is the most likely situation if we get there. But I'm sure both teams would love to end the series before we get to that point. Yeah, I mean, you never want to go down to that ace match because that's your back is up against a wall for both teams. You're in a really uncomfortable position. Uh, seating jungle is going to be our next map. Mm, yeah, that 2v2 map. We'll make sure that we have our 2v2 overlay set up and ready to go. But... It is a, uh, it's always a fun thing when we go into the 2v2s because there are a surprising number of players out there who don't really know 2v2 that well. They just sort of play in it because you kind of have to play the 2v2. But there are a lot of 2v2 specialists out there, and I think that is always one of the most misleading points where you'll look at someone's border and say, oh, well, you know what, they're just in diamond or they're just in platinum or something. But in 2v2, they are effectively Masters League. They understand the 2v2 meta, and that gives them a huge edge, even over some of the Grandmaster level players. Yes, indeed. But uh, before we get into this 2v2, I do want to play another quick ad from one of our sponsors, Band Gaming. They have a great social app. Uh, you can get it on the Google Play Store. You can get it on the uh, Apple App Store. And you guys should check it out. It's a great way to organize a CSL team. It's a great way to organize just about anything uh, related to gaming. Got some great social features, a calendar, anything you need to be a clan leader, a raid leader, or whatever. So I am going to play a quick ad from them, and when we come back, we're going to have our 2v2 match. Ben, Sam, and Ken are on separate journeys to defeat the menacing Vile Dragon. Well, let's just say luck isn't on their side. If only there was a way for them to find each other and band together. Well, that's why there's Band. It's a mobile app that allows people to come together using common interests. With Band, you can find fellow gamers, chat, schedule gaming sessions, and conduct polls. Stage epic battles with friends while sharing videos and photos along the way. So try Band today. Band. Be together. Two, one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello, and welcome back to the CSL. We've got an amazing match for you here. It's going to be a 2v2. So, uh, Ravi, why don't you go ahead and introduce our first team? Absolutely. We are going to be starting up in the top right-hand corner of the map, on top of the teal Terran player. Give it up for the representative from University of Waterloo. It's going to be Powerfoe, Teal Terran player. 
And his teammate, the blue Zerg, is going to be Sky. Also known as Sky Prodigy. And their opponents in the bottom right, or just the bottom side, uh, playing for Team RIT. We have in the lower right hand corner, it is going to be Griffith. And in the lower left hand corner, it's going to be Bew. So, uh, we were talking about this a bit in the break. Do you think, given the fact that BU is a Protoss player, their name could be a tribute to BSU? You never know. You honestly never know with nicknames. There are some people who create nicknames and you just want to assume something. And it just ends up being absolutely completely false. Uh, I just, I make no assumptions with anyone's nickname anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's fair enough. I think the nickname meta is fun to comment upon, especially, like, if you ever cast Chinese tournaments, a lot of players just, like, you'll have, like, high grandmasters in China, and they'll just grab uh, top Koreans' names. Like, you'll have a... There's a player just named F. Parting. Or, like, Bisu Star. Committed. Yeah. I wonder I wonder what they're going to do now that Parting's retired. <laughs> Maybe they'll drop the F, right? They can just become Parting, Ascend. They can just... I'm parting. I think they still soul train like every single game, no joke. That's impressive because you don't see sentries that often in PvZ anymore. Yeah, unless you watch Pilly Pilly play, man. <laughs> shout shout out to Pilly. All right, but anyways, we've got a 2v2. Uh, as you mentioned, you were talking about kind of some people are specialists in this matchup, right? I'm curious uh, which of these two teams is going to bust out more developed strategies because I don't see any like kind of flagrant science of early game aggression, which is what's so common in kind of the higher level 2v2 metas. Yeah, we have both the Zerg players expanding, of course, which I think is a little bit more common, but both the Terran and the Protoss player are both expanding. So we may be in store for something a bit of a rarity sometimes in 2v2, but it's a situation where none of the four players went for some kind of crazy cheese or anything. They're both just or all of them are just going to end up playing a bit of a macro game. And these are actually a bit of a delight to cast because you get to see players teching up, you get to see big armies, you get to see lots of harassment-based uh, attacks, and it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, one thing I, uh, I love seeing in 2v2s so that's pretty common when you see players a lot is the Protoss will often make like 20 Phoenixes. And the reason for that is... Uh, if you make an army to deal with the, the Protoss' Phoenixes, right, it tends to be very specialized and kind of spongy, and it will just die to the ground army of your opponent. So I'm curious uh, if we're going to see that Stargate. I think it would be in the next minute or so. We haven't seen any post cybernetics core tech out of our Protoss player yet, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I would really love to see that. I think that's a fun style to watch, even if it can be a bit infuriating to play against. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we do see just a decent number of adepts being made. I do w always wonder, you know, in 2v2, I think sometimes it can be harder to put on light forms of ground aggression. I think air aggression is a lot more common just because it's a bit more mobile. You can move around between uh, your opponent's bases a little bit more easily, but ground aggression that's harassment is a bit more rare. Things like adepts, you have a lot harder of a time actually making them work because your opponents just have two different armies. They can be in a lot more locations. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that, but we are going to be seeing uh, RIT try to make some of this ground aggression work as three adepts shade up. There's no wall at the front, which is a good start for them here. These adepts are going to be walking up towards this main base. Uh, Queen steps up here. These adepts are going to engage a drone, pick one of those off. They're going to shade over to the right. Bear in mind, they could get surrounded without knowing it because the vision is so much shorter. But no, they are going to get away with the shade, and already it looks like they're doing a decent bit of damage. Yeah, killing a few workers here and there. There are a few Zerglings from Purple also doing some good damage from RIT. Uh, having to back out eventually, but the Adepts are still getting some damage done, and they do end up shading around a little bit further. You know, one trend I've noticed, and I'm not saying it's going to happen here, but in all these CSL 2v2 games we've casted, uh, I've noticed a lot of the times one team will just kind of sit back and macro up, uh, one team will harass their brains out and they'll do all this damage and they'll get themselves really ahead. And then because it's a 2v2 and it's a weird game, they don't know how to close it. And then the team that kind of sat back and took a bunch of damage often ends up winning because 2v2 is, like, I can't emphasize this enough, 2v2 is very different than 1v1. Absolutely. And it's just also that idea that you can do a lot of damage to one player, 
and the other player could have spent a lot of time teching up and just have so much more cost efficient of an army that it allows them to do all the crazy things that uh, makes up for not really having a teammate that's that effective anymore. Oh, Dark Shrine gonna be coming out for BU. I, I love Dark Shrines in 2v2s. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, right, so in a typical base, at this or a typical game, you have maybe three bases at this point in the game to uh, spread your Dark Shrines across and try to find, or your Dark Templar, rather, to try to find mm -hmm. some damage. In a 2v2, you have to take whatever your base amount is, uh, let's say three for this game, multiply it by two, you have six potential points for DTs to do damage, and that's just, I mean, you're probably going to find something, let's be real, right? If you have six places for your DTs to go look for some damage, you're probably going to find something, and I think because of that, uh, and just the general chaos of 2v2, DTs are a very powerful option. Absolutely. And to remember that with 2v2s, there is that communication aspect. Oftentimes, Zerg players, uh, we didn't actually end up seeing uh, Griffith really relying on his opponent or his teammate to get observers or anything. But I don't think I really end up seeing any overseers from our uh, blue Zerg player. Okay, no, there are a couple of overseers sitting with his army now. But there is always that situation where you have a DT inside your main base and you're just yelling at your teammates, scan, 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 scan. It sort of devolves this uh, the team, I guess the team alliance that ends up existing. You don't really feel like you have a teammate. You just have this person who's kind of attached to you and isn't really anymore. <laughs> yeah, it can definitely put a morale or a drain on the morale, and that's a really important aspect of team games. We do now see Blue stepping up here to try to do some damage on top of Purple, who has Mutas out already, but because of uh, because of the map size and the kind of back and forth aggression, these Mutas haven't been able to really get out onto the map and do what they want. Instead, they're forced to defend, chase off some drops, uh, and Blue is already transitioning into Hydralisks back at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's gotten down to a decent number of these Hydralisks, and of course, <laughs> it only to get the upgrade for them. I don't think he's gotten any of the Hydralis upgrades. Okay, there's the first one. Groove Spines finally started to come out. Roachworn also coming down, as well as a, a new hatchery being taken. Uh, Sky, very, very uh, aware of that War Prism, is going to be able to take it out pretty soon, especially since it does not turn back into mobile mode. Oh, there we go. Uh, using that uh, extended range pickup in Legacy of the Boy to grab the Adepts and get the hell out of there without losing a single one. I think there was an opportunity to actually do a lot more damage if those Adepts deployed right when the uh, the hatch went down. I think they probably could have snagged at least a cancel there. But he's going to get away with no damage taken is pink. So that's, that's not too big of a deal. And I think both teams, honestly, are in a pretty solid position to kind of crash into each other in a macro game as we enter these early mid stages. Yeah, what I find pretty interesting is just the fact that Powerfo is leading up a little bit in supply above almost everyone else. He's been really able to just power up, and it's as a Terran player, not even as a Zerg player or anything. So just getting a Marine, and I want to say Marauders, but it's Marauder, that <laughs> single player that he's made, uh, as well as just a couple of Widow Mines and Medivacs. Indeed, but Powerfo is going to be stepping on a creep. It's actually a bit hard to distinguish where the uh, the opponent's creep ends and the allied creep begins. So it, it'll be interesting to make sure that Power Foe is aware of whether or not his opponent does have vision of him uh, as he continues to move deeper into his opponent's territory here. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting, there is an advantage to spreading onto your opponent's creep, and it's the idea that you get vision of that. Your opponent has to still scan or, you know, use some sort of form of detection to actually clean up those creep tumors. But, oh, we got Powerfo stimming on forward. Maybe looking to snipe off that Warp Prism. Really nicely done over there. That's going to definitely cut down on the aggression. Yeah, excellent pack off there by uh, Waterloo. It looks like uh, these Hydras were in a position to try to put some pressure onto the fourth, but instead they are going to be pulling back, maybe waiting for some more uh, Roach support, help tank things up, a couple of Zerglings at the front. And now it looks like they're going to be making a move to try to put some damage onto the opponent of uh, Waterloo. Oh, this is a scary moment. So many High Templars available now for BU, and he did end up finishing Storm. Charges on the way, so even though the army is not that scary just yet, Hydralis and Marines are not exactly the units you want to have running through Psionic Storms. Absolutely not. With that plus damage to light, it just melts everything. And I, I almost worry that Waterloo is waiting too long right now. Could you imagine if all this aggression had crashed in? But they are going to be meeting their opponents in the middle of the map here. 
Yeah, funny enough, Vio is pretty far out of position to help his teammate out, though. And you can see that Griffith feels like he just needs to engage into this, but he ends up losing all the Banelings. All the Zergans go down. Now the Stalkers start coming in. Maybe some good Storms can still turn this around, but look at how far back those High Temples are. They're finally getting into involved in this. But I feel like too much damage has already been done. The Concave is actually there. Almost Defender's advantage, I want to say, <laughs> going Pressers. Yeah, the storms were really good, and they did manage to force those hydralisks back. But the uh, bio remained mostly intact, and that's going to be very unfortunate for uh, Griffith, who is relying primarily on mulisks to try to make things happen here. And uh, one templar, the final templar, rather, does fall, and it looks like this bio is just going to kind of power on through these hatcheries. And I, I don't really know what uh, what Griffith is supposed to do to try to consolidate uh, consolidate his side of the map. Yeah, Power of Foe is just going to continue to push on forward. He's going to be able to take out two of the bases right now of Griffith, bringing Griffith down to just effectively half a mining base. His main base is basically mined out at this point. I think that Power of Foe may even be able to continue to pushing on forward. Yeah, a little bit of cute Blink Micro is going to come out here from BU, but without those uh, Psionic Storms to help back this up, this is going to be a very mm -hmm. difficult hold with just Blink Stalkers. A huge bio reinforcement flank does come in from behind, and I think that's going to force all of these units back as uh, Waterloo continues to power on through this 2v2 here in the CSL. Yeah, I think a combination of the fact that both uh, Powerful as well as his teammates Sky end up investing a lot of that extra gas into the upgrades and everything, whereas we ended up seeing... RIT going more for some of that tech, going up for the High Templars, going up for Storms, but just not quite having his army in position to help defend it. That is the problem with those High Templars. They're not exactly super mobile units. Yeah, I think it would have been a very different engagement if we'd seen both armies fighting together. I mean, uh, I think kind of from the beginning, one of the mantras of StarCraft is more stuff wins. And when you have two players worth of stuff versus one player's worth of stuff, and then another player's worth of stuff, it just looks very different than if you see two players worth of stuff versus two players worth of stuff. That was not articulate. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, at this point, we do have Sky and Powerful just taking out all of their opponents' uh, extra bases. We have, what, one base left for Griffith that's not really mining. And we have one base left for B that's not really mining. And these two players are really just trying to spend their banks to get whatever kind of value they can. Griffith still has a pretty good mineral and gas bank, but unfortunately, Larva is the big uh, problem right now for him. Yeah, I think we're going to be seeing Waterloo advance into that Archon match with a 2-1 lead here as uh, all of these units get on top of the Protoss production. All these gateways can actually be unpowered with a, a single pylon, it looks like, from where I'm sitting. These Hydra's going to spill in from the back and get on top of everything. At this point, it's just drones and overlords. Griffith's at 5 supply, uh, his teammate at 15. There is nothing left, and I think it's all over but the Kryon. Yeah, I'm basically, I'm really a big fan of how exactly University of Waterloo just played this out in terms of teammate synergy. I think teammate synergy for University of Waterloo was really, really strong. And I think for exactly that reason, I do want to actually give University of Waterloo a big congratulations on their 2-1 lead in this series, but also, Joe, how would you feel about giving them the Ban Gaming Award for this broadcast? I think that would be terrific. Um, I mean, their their teamwork was incredible. Their coordination was incredible, and uh, they, banded they banded together. I thought I thought you were referencing something <laughs> more specific than just band gaming. No, just the band gaming band together award. I like. You ever have like a moment where you're like, oh god, oh god, did did I miss something? Are we yeah. are we giving these guys a trophy? <laughs> but no, ab absolutely. I mean, they showed organization, right? Either of these guys could be a raid leader or a clan leader, uh, wh whoever was in charge. And mm -hmm. we're going to see another great uh, opportunity for teamwork with the Archon match coming up. Yeah, and of course, it's worth noting that, as you were saying, there is going to be a bit of that team synergy coming on with that Archon mode match, maybe even more so than in that 2v2. But Powerful is going to be making yet another return to that Archon mode match. Team up. Uh, teaming up with Livy B, who is, again, that Grandmaster level Terran player. They're both going to be playing Terran. And they will be facing off versus RIT's very own, the Yankees 213, someone who we haven't seen before. And uh, I Love Coloring. So I Love Coloring, one of the uh, pretty good Masters League players. Didn't quite get to show it versus Livy B, but uh, should be a pretty fun match. All right, guys, but before we take a look at that, I'm going to go ahead and roll a quick clip 
from band gaming we saw these guys win the band gaming award for teamwork and uh, if you want to win it too we'll hop on the google play store hop on the apple app store with your phones i think they even have a like html5 web client available so whatever your preferred platform of accessing that kind of social media stuff uh just make sure you grab it it's band gaming and uh, i'm gonna play a little ad in case you want to learn more about it only 14.99 Don't miss the call. Download Band. Communication made easy. Where's Ray's? <laughs> hey, man. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the CSL. Uh, we have an Archon match coming up here for you. And uh, spawning in our bottom left hand corner, playing for Team uh, Waterloo. It's going to be Power Foe and uh, Livy B. Mm -hmm. And spawning up in the top right hand corner of the map, we have the Yellow Zerg players representing Team RIT. Give it up for, oh man, what are these names? I guess it's CT78 and the Yankees. Yankees 213 and I Love Coloring. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Good read on that. Archon is a little <laughs> bit tricky, right? Because you have to throw the, the whole names into one, uh, one kind of condensed, condensed, I don't even know what to call it, super name? Super name? It's an Archon name. Oh, that's so good. I think like in the lore, Archons actually have specific names. No, I mean, it's literally Archon mode. It's the Archon mode name. <laughs> it's not even a clever thing, Joe. <laughs> no, but it, like... It's the Archon mode name. <laughs> so I don't... Do you like Do you like the lore, like the StarCraft lore? I do. I love the StarCraft lore. It's pretty fantastic. So if you ever go play with the map editor, or if you've ever played in like those they're like official blizzard campaigns from brood war but like they're they're weird they're not voice acted and everything like archons play a really big role in them and like mm -hmm. they start out as templars right and they get these new names when they merge like like tastosis you know 
So like you'll have. I thought archons don't last very long. They don't, but like then also they last in a thirteen mission campaign because it's video game lore and it's not that consistent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? Like I love like, the StarCraft like, lore. About forty seconds, according to the StarCraft Legacy of the Void trailer, or they can last about twenty-seven hours. I, one of the two. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, they get they get like a cool new name like and I, there's actually one in the editor. I'm like exposing my ultra nerdum in the the StarCraft two editor. I forget the name of it, but there's a name for uh, what's his face uh, Tassadar and um, Zera Tools uh, Templar or Archon rather. They never became an Archon though. I know, but it's in the map editor. Like their Archon. Oh. Because maybe it was a story idea at one point, so they programmed it in or something. Interesting. Oh, man. That brings up all kinds of questions, because <laughs> technically Chassadar was dead. Yeah, but, oh. like, did they know he was dead when they wrote Wings of Liberty? I don't know, man. I uh, That happened before the expansion for Brood War even came out. That was a long time ago. But either way, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a ZVT going on here. No Protoss involved, but the Reaper does end up going down. It's a little bit damaged, but honestly, not nearly as much as it would have liked to, because this isn't just a normal ZVT. This is an Archon mode ZVT. You should have the best control possible in these kind of situations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's... Like, generally speaking, I think the way most players approach this kind of matchup is you have one guy whose only job is to macro, one guy's only job is to micro, at least in the early stages of the game. <laughs> and the fact that you see a Reaper going down to Lings, it's uh, it's really unfortunate for our Terran Archon here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, University of Waterloo gonna want to make sure that they have good unit retention because keeping all the units they can alive is really important because you can see right now, okay, what is probably... Uh, what is it Powerpo and uh, Livy B? What are what are what is the micro player really doing right now? There's not a whole lot. You can kind of chase down any overlords that you think are around, but realistically, if that Reaper is still alive, it could be moving around on the map. Could get, be getting some information on what the drone saturation is at that third. They could be forcing out more units. Just having that extra unit alive makes a huge difference in terms of being able to make use of the resources you have, which is basically this extra APM you normally don't have because you have a teammate. Absolutely. Um, we're just not going to see any of that. Instead, what we see is this uh, the Zerg player knocking down the rocks. That's pretty typical, as we would see on Galactic Process. And uh, the Terran player is going to be looking for a drop, but actually decides to uh, bow out of that and try to catch the speed overlord that's bouncing around inside the natural. And uh, I wonder, this should give a little bit of extra warning, actually, for uh, for the Zerg Archon that a drop is incoming. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be too big of a surprise since they did it. I'm seeing the two racks plus the uh, starport going up. So you should have a decent idea of what the timing is on this. It's a very, very common build. I mean, this is one of the most common ZVT builds that existed for a while. The two racks, uh, two medevac push in. But, well, taking out the rocks is barely in the nick of time. Actually, <laughs> Arfell and Livy be helping out a little bit with that. Yeah, indeed. And uh, now we see the Terran Archon stepping onto creep here. Uh, Powerful and Livy B are going to be looking to find some damage potential. But uh, they're not really going to be able to. This queen heavy uh, style of play is so popular because I think for a long time a lot of Terrans were just doing the 2 1 1 like B undrop, we call it. And this just shuts it down really well as long as your units are in the correct position. Mm hmm. Huh? Wouldn't mind getting some decent number of uh, Zargon kills. No drone kills quite just yet, but Marines are going to be dropping out in the main base, see what damage they can get done, but it seems like the yellow Zerg players are very much on top of this. Maybe we'll be able to get the medevac, since the medevac was boosting on cooldown. Queen gets the snipe off. Well done. Indeed, and now these wings are going to come up once again and surround, push this away. So far, this has been an absolutely excellent uh, hold from our Zerg uh, RIT Archon. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have finally the Lair Tech coming up right now for the Zergs, and well, it, well, it is a slightly more delayed Lair Tech just because they were busy dealing with all the forms of aggression. They've gotten up to a pretty decent economy, they've gotten their double upgrade started, they just have to be a bit careful about taking too much more damage from this uh, Marine Marauder pressure, because 
honestly, I gotta say, they, they've gotten away with a good bit of greed with not having any banelings, not having any roaches, not even really having, I, mean, I guess they do have a decent number of queens, but delaying their lair tech and really being able to get out those upgrades so quickly is definitely really nice for them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I do I do want to point out that Spire is going to be on the way here. So we're going to see Meatling Bling, which I think is a composition that's kind of fallen out of favor in the current meta. A lot of the times you just see pure Ling Bling uh, Queen straight up into those Ultralisks. But perhaps Meatling Bling will start uh, making a comeback with the Ultras like Ultimate Armor being nerfed. You know, I do also wonder if this is just a decision around the fact that it's Archon mode. When you have a Roach Hydra composition, which is a lot stronger now because Hydras are just so ridiculously strong in the matchup these days, or not even in the matchup, it's really strong units in general these days. But Mutals are just so much more microable. They have just so much more potential to, as I was saying before, utilize the extra APM you have in Archon mode. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think you're right on that. I mean, Hydras are obviously a bit a movie, but uh, it's going to be on our Zerg Archon here from uh, from RIT to try to hold on to this push. They look to be in a solid position. Banelink speed is not yet done, though, and that gives a lot of credibility for this bio here. Uh, they're going to be cleaning up a lot of links for free at the front. That's going to soften up this army for the push. There's still a lot of queens behind. Some links are coming around to wrap on the back. A couple of mines are going off on top of all of these... Uh, all of this bio rather and it looks like we're going to see a big pullback yeah the queens are a really important part of this push in the banelings are there but i don't think they actually want to use the banelings right now they just want to push this force back and be able to continue to uh not even necessarily drone up they already had a pretty decent drone count at 66 but really get out those mutilists but you have to remember all of those banelings that were made takes away gas from the mutilus count, which by the way, they still haven't started just yet. In fact, it seems like uh, they, I don't know, they have overlords on the way, but they're not really supply block just yet. I guess they're starting to get supply block now with Zergans being made. Yeah, it, it almost feels like the the Banelings and all, all of these units we're seeing being churned out are kind of, uh, they, they just don't want to die. They just don't want to die. They just want to feel stable. And then they want to crank that muta pump, open up the fire hose and just have like 20 meters pop out at once, right? But they need to make sure they don't take right uh, damage right now for that to happen. Yeah, I feel like they've missed their opportunity a little bit though. They are doing a good job pushing this force back, but Levy B and Powerful are doing a nice job keeping majority of their units alive. Even if they lose a few, they're sniping off Banelings in the meanwhile, and finally the mules are starting to come out. But really, what are they gonna actually be able to do? When you have a Terran force in front of your face pushing forward, the Mutals have a really hard time unless you can actually force the lift up into the medevacs. Indeed, and uh, they're trying their best, these Zerglings are. They're coming off the uh, coming off of creep to try to take a fight. Drones are coming off the line to retreat back here. And even though it started out as a really solid hold for, uh, for RIT, it looks like Waterloo has locked down a pretty uh, strong contain here. Mm -hmm. Well, here we go. We got Banelings charging on in. Going to try and get the best connections they can find, but not really finding a whole lot. The Mutals are still here, and there is a lack of bio inside of the natural expansion, but here come the reinforcements. Manor Mules being dropped down. I wonder which player did that, as it does seem like Powerful and Livibee are going to be able to take the game, and I believe uh, the series. Yeah, that is going to be it for us, guys, and this concludes... Uh at least like other other than the possibility of some makeup matches or anything next week this is going to conclude the regular season of csl mm -hmm. yeah thank you all so much for tuning in for the csl checking out the starcraft stuff and of course to all the players that have been playing in it it's been absolutely delight to catch all these guys playing these games but of course again congratulations goes out University of Waterloo, who I don't think we know their actual score because I think there's been a bit of a delay in terms of reporting results and stuff, but we know that they're at least 2-1, and one, possibly, probably better. Yeah, uh, Waterloo's been a very strong team. I would expect to see them in the playoffs. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just laughing at a little bit of the conversation when you start talking about the, the delay with the reporting, of course. But this season wouldn't have been possible without our wonderful sponsors. And uh, our sponsors are, of course, Twitch, the platform you're watching this on. Uh, it's the best streaming platform out there. And also, of course, Band Gaming, a really great social app. 
Um, before we wrap, we'll play one last vid, so any of you guys that are maybe just jumping in to watch the last match, you get an idea of what they do, but uh, I, I think we're coming into a close on our season here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely be sure to check out our sponsors, as you mentioned. Band Gaming is a really great platform. Of course, I think we still have a couple of videos that we can still roll. Once again, in case you tuned in late uh, for the broadcast, to do sh be sure you go check out Band Gaming. It's a really, really great organization or a, a great thing that you can use to communicate with your CSL team. Make sure that you're ready for the playoffs or maybe even just getting ready for the next season of CSL. You didn't quite make it there. Yeah, guys, and that is going to be it for us. So with that end of the regular season, I want to list uh, or I want to say a wonderful kind of uh, little final message from our uh, from our excellent production director, CHL. He says, everyone, have a good night and study hard. We'll see you in the spring and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Only $14.99. Don't miss the call. Download Band. Communication made easy.